Hello, everyone, and welcome to Greek Wine Club's Sip Clip session. I'm your host, Fotis Tamos, and with me, my co-host and good friend, Ari Kalos. What's up, Forti? How are you? Good in yourself. I'm pretty good. Always excited for the Greek Sip Clips because I get nice Greek wine in the mail, and I get to open it up and enjoy it and, uh, and learn something new. Excellent. Well, that's uh, the, the purpose of our segments is to obviously uh, educate our audience and also to uh, enlighten, give some great tips so that way you can appreciate the wine or the wines and enjoy them a lot better with our advice. Yes, but, um, I always do because, uh, again, I, I believe that there's a lot of psychology with wine. Uh, correct right. me if I'm wrong, but uh, but when I sip a glass of wine that I know nothing about, never heard anything about it, just take a sip, I'll enjoy it, sure. maybe I won't. But if I do a sip clip, for example, or we have a webinar and I'm drinking a wine, the wine is always better, always. I, there's, there's some definitely truth to what you're just saying uh, because I, through trial and error with a lot of our uh, educational sessions, Pre-COVID, when we were doing actual events and seminars, um, we're true believers that the chemistry and the energy when you're in an environment um, and you're kind of creating the, the, um, the feel and uh, what's coming up psychologically, you're preparing to start to enjoy what's coming around. So there is some kind of uh, um, connection between the environment, the energy, and what you're going to have. And often enough, I use the example where, uh, not to cut you off real quickly, a lot of our guests over the years have come to a lot of our sessions where um, there's a high percentage of individuals who do not like something in particular. Mm -hmm. And when we're featuring that specific or type of wine that they do not enjoy, a high percentage, and I'm, and I'm going to be very um, modest here, at least eight to nine out of 10 folks who tell us in the beginning that they don't enjoy something, by the end of the session, they actually change their opinion. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Right? And, and so, you know, something a little more extreme on that tip is, uh, have you ever seen, have you ever been like, in like a winery on Santorini and people are like, oh, this is filth, I can't drink this. Like, <laughs> you'll never hear that. <laughs> no, no, it, to your point, yes. When you're in that element, everything, <laughs> feels and tastes better. Um, but once you take yourself out of the element, uh, things are cold. So, you know, you, you can tell like even at wine tastings where some of the more generic, uh, very um, cookie cutter approaches to tasting wines, whether they're, you know, at a wine shop where there's a table set up and there's a bunch of wines open and there's like these little sampling cups and, you know, someone's there pouring samples for you with some tasting notes and you're just sipping. Um, Usually, uh, I don't feel that that's the best approach to um, getting to understand and appreciate a wine, even though it's a lot better to get a sample before you purchase something yeah. so you have a little bit. Of, but even that environment isn't always the best either, in my opinion. Um, but at least here with our segments, um, we really want you to get to know what you're about to experience and give you some history, fun facts, some of our, our own personal tips and uh, perspectives on the wine. And then we taste together and we often enough find that uh, most folks do appreciate um, the, the whole journey from history, information, tips, and sipping together. And then that kind of changes their opinion about something uh, that was negative before, or if they never had it before, it's a blank slate. So it's a great introduction to wines that uh that people are curious about yeah and the you know you you explain things very well you have a nice easy going voice uh and i think oh, thank you. The, fact, the fact that we we're doing greek wines uh that should just yeah. put you in a in a mood in an atmosphere of of nice like like thoughts and memories um so, so, yeah, I, I, I'm I looking mean, forward. even even your background should already set the mood for how things are going to taste. I mean, <laughs> I mean, 
that alone is like, you know, you pour me anything and it's going to be good for me. And then one last little tiny piece of information. Uh, when we did pre COVID, uh, uh, physical events, cases and events, like you and I always will have fun. We'll joke around. We'll laugh. We'll like, we'll get the people like kind of up and at it. And I've, in any event I've ever done with you, I've never seen like a upset, like taster. Right. I mean, and don't get, don't get me wrong. And I think uh, we've handled it pretty well, but we do occasionally get, you know, the individual or individuals that are very particular yeah. and, um, you know, are very, very, have a tough shell to break when it comes to, uh, you know, offering uh, or suggesting but we always find a way that by the end of any event, that person that's so difficult to turn on ends up actually changing their mind towards the end and they become yeah. followers, lovers of what we do and, and so forth. But in any, in any event, uh, so our segments here are basically to explore the different regions of Greece's wine culture. And, you know, even today, even though Greece has had its ups and downs, uh, over the years and decades, you know, Greece is still a relatively small producing market. Um, it's a small country relative to other countries that produce wine. Yeah. Um, even though historically it's recorded, you know, Greeks have been producing wine for thousands of years, uh, you know, because of its, you know, rich history of exploring and a lot of the, you know, different, uh, explorers and the empires that were created over, over the centuries and through history you know as merchants you know greeks brought with them you know not just their culture but they brought some of their you know agriculture they brought fruits and vegetables that, that they traveled with they brought their wines with them and so on so long story short you know greeks have planted their seeds um, in different parts of the world oh, yeah. but over the years um you know things have changed and I'm not sure if you if you know this, but in the U.S. Um, back in the '60s and as late as the late '50s, early '60s, um, Greek wines had a a moment. Uh, they are actually were uh, in the top tier of imported wines into the U.S. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, exported wines into the U.S. Uh, because at the time there was you know a growing population of Greek immigrants coming over. Mm -hmm. You know there was settling. And uh, there was a big demand uh, because of that, that generation uh, to consume Greek wines. So um, there was a very popular brand at the time called Ahea Klaus, which most folks might still remember. But it was a brand in the U.S. back in the 60s and 70s. And then uh, they came up with this line called Domestica. Domestica White and Red and Retsina were the three skews of Greek wines that were actually believe it or not, at, in every, almost every major retail outlet in 50 states in the U.S. What? Every state had a distributor, because of the import at the time, that placed a hair Klaus's line saying, in every you're saying, state. You're saying like Alabama and Mississippi? <laughs> Alaska, <laughs> Hawaii. Uh, Montana, South Dakota, I mean, yes. And it was, you know, it was a moment because it was the movement back then. There was, you know, there was an influx of Greeks coming over. So, um, you know, just like in the very beginning too with the Italian market uh, back in the 30s and 40s, you know, the, there was a huge Ita Italian uh, uh, influx of immigrants coming over. So there was a lot of Italian wine being consumed in the ethnic markets, yeah. not the mainstream, but ethnic markets. So same thing there. And, you know, as time went on, you know, as time was going on and, you know, generations were moving along, um, fast forward to the late 80s, early 90s, then there was a shift. Things started to slow down. And, um, and we just started to see the decline uh, of Greek wines for different reasons. It was a combination of business practices going wrong, mm. uh, supply chains being broken, uh, production levels in Greece being kind of inconsistent, yeah. uh, quality levels being inconsistent. 
and other markets were coming about and they were becoming trendy and they were taking over the lion's share of, of, of the market. So Greece kind of took a step back, struggling at that point to try to get back into the market. And it wasn't until the 2004 Olympics that Greece had another moment again. Uh, you know, we were hosting the Olympics. Greece made it to the European Cup, won the European Cup, which yeah. was made, I think we marked the anniversary of a couple of weeks ago, 4th of July, uh, when Greece won the World Cup. I mean, uh, the European Cup, I'm sorry. And then there was a, a surge of, of Greekness again in the mainstream market. So uh, we started to see, again, wonderful selections coming over from Greece and things were going well. And then it died out again. And uh, here we go. Here we are again with another surge with, uh, you know, an another generation of, of, of individuals in the Greek in the wine industry in Greece. Oh, I, think, it, uh, it I think our Greek sip clips are going to be the next resurgence for Greece. That's what we're, that's what we're <laughs> aiming. So we want all of our audience to continue to, to tune into our segments so that you can learn and understand that Greece has such a wonderful wine culture. And it's so special and unique because you can't find these productions anywhere in the world. Like, for example, um, the varieties that grow in Greece only can grow well in Greece. Yeah. So Cabernet, for example, that comes from France, grows all over the world. You can have Cabernet anywhere in the world. Um, Chardonnay comes from France. It's grown all over the world, right? Um, but when it comes to Greek varietals, they're so special that they they can only really pers you know persevere in their own what we call terroir in their own soils and climates so um we always encourage folks that you know it's extra special to try wines from greece because you can't find them anywhere else mm -hmm. as far as you know taking the vines and planting them somewhere else and uh seeing what happens in a different country or in a different area it just doesn't work even though they're experimenting uh, with uh, in California, they brought clippings of uh, a Sirtico Nayuritico, and actually somebody brought clippings of a Sirtico to Australia, and they're making white wine uh, from a Sirtico in Australia. But again, it's in a and it's in a testing phase, in my That's opinion. That's interesting. I wonder if, right? it, uh, if it'll be good. Yes. So, sorry, I keep sipping here because I can't put the glass down. But in this segment, um, we want to explore a white wine from a varietal called Moscofilero. Yes. Moscofilero. Um, it's a little bit of a tongue twister. And um, when most of our general public thinks of white wines from Greece, usually the only white wines that, uh, that are more familiar are the whites from Santorini, right? Yes. That seems to be the most popular. Yeah. But outside of Santorini, um, there's a there's a, a cluster of different varieties of white wine of white grapes that grow all over Greece. So we're gonna we're gonna choose to travel to the Peloponnese or Peloponnesos area uh, in a region called Mantinia. And for those of us that uh, kind of want to uh, uh, know where is Mantinia in Peloponnesos, it's basically uh, it starts where Tripoli is. So for those of you that are listening, they're familiar with Tripoli. It's the north sort of the central east part of Peloponnesus is where Tripoli is and Mantinia happens to be there as the main region. And in this region of Mantinia, uh, the local variety that grows there is Moscofilero. Um, Moscofilero is a grape that translates to a dry floral muscat, mm. but it's a very unique grape. Um, it's, it's a white grape, but it has gray skins. So it almost has like a little bit of a pinkish hue to the color of the grape. Yeah. If you were ever to travel to these uh, vineyards in in, um, in Mantinia. Have you been to Tripoli before? Uh, I have, yes. You have. So sort of like, you know, in the foothills of the mountains uh, where it's based out of or it's surrounded by. Uh, very dry, hot summers. Mm -hmm. Very dry and hot. And very cool to slightly cold uh, evenings, right? So it's ideal for grape growing where you've got plenty of sunshine, it's dry, and then at nighttime, the grapes get cooled off by the sudden temperature change. Uh, so that ecosystem there yeah. is relatively very um, ideal for the conditions of a grape growing 
in a very healthy manner. Yeah. So Moscophila is the is the common variety that grows there that produces a very crisp, uh, acidic white wine that has plenty of flavor. And the one that we're going to be featuring in our sip clip is from one of our friends and one of the most respected winemakers, in my opinion. His name is Yanis Celepos, and this is from his property, uh, Domain Celepos, uh, and this is his uh, production uh, from Mantinia, 100% Moscofilero. So if you notice on the label, my label happens to be a little wet because the refrigerator is a little too cold, <laughs> is that on the label, uh, it says Mantinia. When it says Mantinia, that means this is an Appalachian wine. So Mantinia is the Appalachian, so by, by law, in order to put Montigny on your label, your wine has to be produced by 100% Moscofilero. Interesting. All right. So why don't we pour a glass, Ari, and let's start sipping together. So um, I'm not sure if it does justice here in our in our video segment, but um, if you pour a glass of this white wine, it's it's typically crystal clear, but depending on where you position it to the lighting, there's a slight hue of like a slither of pink in there or gray. I'm not sure if you can pick that up, but it's off enough not noticed. But if you really pay attention, yeah, you, you can, can see, see it. something with the color, but right? not in that detail. So, so, so I want you to pay attention before you sip on the wine to the aromas. So, Moscofilero uh, always releases very uh, strong floral aromas. I'm not sure if you're picking that up in the in the nose, but automatically uh, for me, I can distinguish Moscofilero right from the aroma from the from what we call the bouquet, the aromas that are coming from the wine, right? Very floral. It reminds me of like rose petals yeah. or rose or rose water and to some extent. And then as far as the wine itself, it typically uh, produces wines that are very citrusy. This does remind me of a New World Sauvignon Blanc. Mm. Not, and when I say New World, you know, I mean like there's Old World Sauvignon Blanc would basically mean French Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah. New World means anything outside of France. So South Africa, California, not so much New Zealand, because New Zealand is very unique when they produce their Sauvignon Blancs. But it's, to me, uh, almost a New World in the style because it's very flavorful. Mm. Let's take a sip. Cheers. That's really? nice. I, nice, refreshing. Crisp, refreshing. Um, you know, very zippy. I like to use the word zippy in this one because the acidic part of the wine, along with the citrus flavors, it's like vibrant, right? It's like yeah. like dancing, dancing in your mouth. And you um, have you have yours in the fridge, correct? I had mine's in the fridge, yes. Like just a full on refrigeration, not not a chiller. No, refrigerator. I I like um for the, for the segments to, to show you the acidic part of the wine to keep it nice and cold, even though as it warms up, it's going to release more flavor. But yeah, I had in the refrigerator. I did too, per your recommendation, which I, which I like. I like, I like so crisp, nice wines. With their, with the follow through, Arian, is that the wine is very well balanced. It has good fruit, meaning that you can taste the fruit of the grape. Um, and it also has a nice clean finish. Um, it doesn't have any lingering aftertastes. Um, it just finishes nice and so even though it's crisp, it finishes clean. It mm -hmm. doesn't leave an aftertaste is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And that on a hot summer day, when you're out, uh, on your patio poolside and you're having seafood, you're having fish, you're having octopus. Uh, if you're in a taverna in Greece and so forth, seaside, I mean, this is basically uh, part of the experience. Like this complements the, you know, the feeling of being in a nice environment, the freshness of the seafood that you probably are having. And it just continues to like make you want to keep sipping this. Yeah. And, uh, you, know, the, you know, I look forward to doing all of those things. And the Greek sip clips that we do more so than anything else 
give me that yearning and that environment and the, the wine complements all those feelings and memories and right, right. desires to do it. And I, I love that aspect of it. I, I don't know if it's just because of our culture, if it's, I, I don't know what. I think it's a combination of, yeah. you know, uh, we're very grateful and thankful that we're, you know, we're, you know, culture that is uh, full of, uh, full of life and then combined with our, uh, our, you know, interest in being in this industry and hosting events and dinners and being around groups of great people and we're constantly entertaining. Uh, you know, it just, it goes, all of this just goes hand in hand. Yeah. And uh, do, we, do we carry this wine? Yes. Yeah, so this is on our platform, on our shopping cart. So um, people can so, pick it up from uh, greekwineclub.co? Yep, definitely, definitely can order this on greekwineclub.co, whether and it's a local delivery or it's being shipped. And I would suggest uh, everybody download the free Greek Wine Club app as well, because everything we do is on there. Easy shopping there as well. And we post everything. So you can definitely learn more, get stuff, and just enjoy. Yeah. And also, you know, also let our audience know that, you know, always feel free to contact us with questions or recommendations. Even if you're in a pinch, if you have something uh, in mind, you, whether you email us, send us a message on Instagram or Facebook, we always encourage, we love getting questions. Yeah. So please feel free to reach out to us. I love getting uh, questions because I forward them right to you. <laughs> that's the beauty of what we do together, right? <laughs> but uh, but that's that, there you have it, Ari. So Moscow Filato was the, uh, the featured variety here on our sip clip. We highly recommend it now that it's uh, deep into the summer. You know, it's a great white wine selection. Uh, we, we highly encourage those who haven't tried it to definitely pick up a bottle. We are, in my opinion, I'm confident that you won't be disappointed. Awesome. All right. Excellent, Ari. Yes. Yasu. Cheers. And stay tuned for our next clip. Yes. We'll see you next time. Thank you.